Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, owner lost $1.8 million because he didn't listen to me. The second story, management ordered me to come to work and did not believe me when I was sick, so I bought them a doctor's note. The third story, Manager tried to blame wasted stock on me, told me not to put anything away without him telling me, which resulted in thousands of pounds of fresh produce baking in the sun. On to the first story. Short me $70,000 in violation of our written agreement, it'll cost you $1.8 million. Background. A year out of school in the early 1990s, I procured a job as a business analyst for a large family-owned tech company. This business was located in the booming heart of technology at the time and was very profitable. As tech took off over the next decade, the company thrived and remained family-owned. What was a rich family and company became exceedingly wealthy, with a valuation and net worth in the high 9 and low 10 figures. The family that owned it was quite neurotic, very moody, and had a reputation as very ruthless when it came to financing, deal-making, employees, etc. I truly believe this is what held them back from ultimately becoming a household name as a company. As I progressed in the company, I gained more and more face time with the owners. I worked on some projects directly with ownership that really paid off and gained me even greater access to their inner circle. Now, like a lot of people at the time, and particularly those who worked in tech, I was heavily invested in tech stocks. I discussed some of my investments and gains with ownership as casual conversation, though investing had nothing to do with my role in the company. That is until one day in late 1999, when the owner came to me and asked me if I would invest some of his personal money. He wanted me to take big risks to see if they would pay off, using $1 million of his personal money. I was a bit hesitant, but still being in my late 20s and wanting to prove myself, I said I would. I asked for a written agreement where they acknowledged this wasn't my role in the company, was a personal matter between the owner and me, and to document my compensation for this side arrangement, 20% of all profits. Around this same time and by working in the industry, I started to notice the weakness associated with a lot of tech companies. They just weren't living up to their hype and stock price, and some seemed like they were starting to run out of money. I had no inside information, just a strong sense of which companies were struggling based on my work in the business. Based on this sense, I started using both my money and the owner's money to short tech companies just after the new year in 2000. For anyone unfamiliar with shorting, it means if the value of a stock decreases, the value of the investment increases. I had a few long positions, but my overall position was very short. Since the owner wanted big risk and big reward, I used his money and obtained leverage or margin from the financial institution, where I maintained both his and my trading accounts. The accounts were separate but both under my name. Again, I documented this and gained consent. Well, both my account and his suffered some moderate losses in the first two months of 2000 before the bubble began to burst, and both accounts, but his in particular, began to skyrocket. Ownership's Pettiness In June, the company began to suffer a downturn. We were still profitable, but since we provided tech services and products, we were not immune to weakness in the broader market. I had not informed the owner of my short strategy. He came to me one day and asked how his money was doing, saying he suspected it was way down like the general market. To his surprise, I informed him that while we still had some money tied up in options, puts and shorts, but based on the positions I had closed, there was $1.35 million in cash sitting in the account that belonged to him. Again, I still had a bunch of open positions, which if memory serves were worth about a million on that date, but the positions I had closed had yielded $1.35 million in cash just sitting in his account, which was in my name. The owner, either through ignorance or lack of attention, said, great, $1.35 million. Fantastic work in this down market. Will you please wire it to me? I responded that I would be taking my 20% of the $350,000 profit, or $70,000, before wiring him the $280,000. I also reminded him I still had open positions that had yet to pay off or close, but I didn't state the amount. He once again appeared not to understand or comprehend the open positions statement, but instead totally focused on and became incensed about my rightful claim for $70,000. He went on and on about how times were tough. I should be grateful for a job, particularly at my young age, and the entire $350,000 was necessary for him and the company. I knew this wasn't true based on my position within the company. Worse, this was my first time personally experiencing the greedy and corrupt nature that served as the basis for ownership's reputation. The Revenge Now comes the revenge. 
Since after two separate conversations, the owner didn't seem to grasp that the open positions would yield at least some income, and thus additional profit, I decided not to mention it again. I sent him back the entire $1.35 million and continued to manage the open positions to the best of my ability. And here's the kicker, the owner never brought it up again. He seemed to think the $1.35 million payment was the entire value of the account, and never understood or remembered that open positions still existed. He never asked for records, tax documents, or any time or audit of financials. Given the fact that he was dishonest with me, I didn't feel the need to disabuse him of that notion. Ultimately, after a bit more net gain, I covered all the shorts and exercised all the options, puts in this case, for an additional $1.8 million. I worked for the company for three more years and owner never asked about it during my tenure, after I gave notice or since. I know it's a bit crass and even shady AF, but given his dishonesty with me over the $70,000, I felt justified in keeping the additional $1.8 million. I paid taxes on the gain, long-term cap gain, and went on my way with a fantastic nest egg. Nobody has asked about it since, and I've only told the story to a few people, and even then, only after the statute of limitations passed. The final ironic cherry on top of this Sunday is that during my remaining three years I gained greater influence with ownership in position within the company because they considered me loyal for giving the $1.35 million back and not making too much of a stink about the $70,000 profit. Little did they know I got the better of them. The company eventually folded due to family disputes, but my understanding is that ownership walked away in a very good financial position. They likely could have been a much better and greater company had they not practiced the same dishonesty that they showed me, with their vendors, clients, and employees. The next story is, you're only allowed to work your contractual hours. A couple of years ago, I had a job doing some translating. The job was simple, easy, and boring, but because I had a skill set that was rare and necessary for the job, they needed me more than I needed them. Management were kind of dumb and unhelpful, the kind of managers who would try to write you up for going to the toilet too many times a day, or taking one minute longer on your lunch break because a queue to get past security isn't a good enough excuse. You need to be back five minutes before your lunch ends. A co-worker of mine was reprimanded by management for doing his work too quickly. When he asked what concerns about the quality they had, they told him that it makes everyone else look like they're slacking, which looks bad to the company who outsourced us. So basically, management just wanted everyone to look busy. During my time there, I got diagnosed with a chronic illness that meant I could no longer work my original contractual hours of 40 hours a week. Instead, I would sign a new contract stipulating that I would work Monday through Wednesday 9 to 5. They were very reluctant to do this, and no one else was able to get such an adjustment, but since they couldn't find anyone who spoke my language, they were a little effed. This worked out to be beneficial for both of us. I got my work done a lot faster now that I wasn't chronically worn down, and the company didn't lose my skills. One day I received a letter from a clinic I had been referred to. I was no longer on the waiting list, and they would be able to see me for my initial appointment the following week on the Tuesday. Great, I thought. I'll just let management know. So the next day I speak to my manager. Me. Hey, I've got a clinic appointment come through and it's on Tuesday. I don't know how long it will last and it's an hour drive from work. So I was thinking I could have this Tuesday off and make up the hours on Thursday. They asked for some time to get back to me, and when I followed them up on it the next day, they told me I was only allowed to work my contractual hours. That I would have to take my holiday time off or an unpaid time off, but since it was such short notice they couldn't approve it, and I should be more careful with my planning in the future. The thing is I had been on this waiting list for a couple of months, and the only appointments they give for the initial one is short notice. I would value my health over work any day, so I shrugged and said okay. I called in sick on that Tuesday citing my chronic illness, went to my clinic, and got a doctor's note from my GP. The following day I was immediately called into a meeting. They accused me of skipping work, calling in a fake sickness and threatened me with a disciplinary. I handed them my sick note with my doctor explaining that my illness is chronic and prone to flare-ups. He also included his personal opinion that it's a reasonable adjustment to be able to attend any medical appointments necessary for managing my disability. There was a lot of back and forth with them accusing me of faking it. I refused to sign any disciplinary forms, and eventually I was asked to go back to my desk while they discussed it with higher management. Some time goes by and I'm invited back into the meeting room. Manager, we've come to the conclusion that your absence was valid, and we will accept this sick note from your doctor. However, we would ask that you make up the hours that you missed this Thursday. Me, I'm pleased to hear that. Unfortunately, I will not be able to work this Thursday, as I've been informed that I'm not allowed to work outside my contractual hours. After that, the meeting was pretty much over. Management wasn't happy, but I got my sick pay and didn't work that Thursday. I stuck it out for a couple more weeks, but management was super grating. 
When I handed in my notice, they begged me to stay, offered me a significant pay raise, but working with tedious management just wasn't worth it, and I had great fun telling them that. The last story is, don't put stock away until you say, okay, I'll watch it die. I worked for a small independent green grocers that had a boom of business during the first lockdown and so brought me on to help deal with orders, organizing their website and general admin. I'm the sort of person who likes to get stuck into things wherever I work, and so slowly I started doing bits that were not really my job description, but I helped other staff out. One of these roles was to put stock away and rotate it in the fridges. Every morning we would get a delivery of fresh fruit and veg. I'm talking about six pallets worth of stuff. I would have to go through it, take it to the correct fridge and basically put it behind the older stuff, so that shelves were being stocked with oldest produce first. Now, the manager of the company liked to think he knew exactly what was going to sell every day and would frequently overbuy certain products. This meant that in order to fit everything in, I sometimes had to reorganize where things went. To clarify, the fridge was small. You walked in and could move in an L shape, while seeing all produce pretty much at all times. There was nowhere that couldn't be seen if you moved further into the fridge and simply looked. Because of the overbuying, a lot of produce was stuck in the fridge for days and days and resulted in it going bad. What didn't help was that the manager decided any orders that came in would not get picked from what was in the fridge. It would be picked from the pallets. So we had very little stock movement coming out of the fridge, but loads of produce going in. One Monday morning I come in, I didn't work weekends, to find three pallets worth of rotting produce that the manager had taken out of the fridge on the Saturday and left to sit in the yard behind the shop for me to see. He claimed that I'd been hiding the produce, so the shop assistants were not able to stock the shelves with the older produce, and this resulted in a lot of waste. I took a quick look at the stuff, and as expected it was the products that had been overbought. I tried to say as nicely as possible that there was no way I could have hidden it, and the reason a lot of it was wasted is because we had too much to begin with. But the manager could never be wrong, so he told me from now on not to put any stock away unless he approved it. Q Compliance Next day I come in and it's a scorcher. Very hot for the UK one of the hottest of the year. I see the stock sat outside on pallets and can even see some of it sweating already, despite only being out about 15 minutes before I arrive. Normally I would get straight on it and start putting it away, but I had not been asked yet, so I went up to the office and got on with some admin. Turns out the manager had an appointment that day until around lunchtime, approximately five hours after I arrived, and I turned up to find five pallets of produce, around 4K in value, all nicely baking in the sun. The smell was not great, all soft fruits, berries mostly, had to be thrown immediately, and based on how warm most of it was, only the stuff that had been placed lower down and in the center of the pallets was even viable to save. The manager called me into his office and phoned the owner of the company, so I could explain why we had lost so much produce that day, and you know what, I did just that. My conversation with the owner was short and sweet, and I had no negative consequences come from it. The manager was given a warning, which as he had been pulled up for other issues previously, was a written warning and put him closer to being let go. He stayed another six weeks before deciding this wasn't the job for him. I hope you love these stories. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new video comes out.